Thank you very much, Pat, for the introduction. So what I'm going to talk about today is integrating subject matter experts and experienced solo developers into a software developer, software development team. So I'm going to do this in four parts. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about me, what kind of work I do, just to give you an idea of how I got these experiences integrating a lot of solo developers and subject matter experts into the team. And then I'm going to give you some examples of some of the personalities and some of the people that I've had to integrate um, and how that went. we we'll talk a little bit about how we trained them, how did we give them mentoring, how did we give them coaching, and then talk about some of the mistakes we've made, what I wish I had done better. So just a, a quick introduction to who I am and what Rolls-Royce actually does, because you might not know that, um, and how I got the experience that qualifies me to talk about this. So Rolls-Royce is a company that provides power of various kinds. We don't make cars anymore. We sold that division to BMW. Um, but we do make various kinds of power uh, in the divisions all over the world. It's a large company. It's got about 45,000 people. Uh, and the largest division makes airplane engines, and I work for, for that part of the company. So you might have, if you flew here, you might have flown on an airplane that was powered by a Rolls-Royce engine. I specifically work for Rolls-Royce Rolls Deutschland, which is the division of Rolls-Royce that's here in Germany. We mostly work on regional and business aviation engines. Um, and so if you flew from within Europe, for example, you might have flown on a regional plane that was powered by one of our engines. Rolls-Royce Deutschland has about 3,200 employees. Those employees are fitters. So th those are the people who actually build engines hands-on and repair them and maintain them. They are the engineers who design those engines. Uh, and, of course, designing all the maintenance. And then there are support staff. The point that I'm making is that we're not your typical tech company. We're not a software development company. In fact, um, the only team that I know that does software development inside the company is my team, which is the digital innovation cell. So this is made up of a product owner plus eight developers. Those people are data scientists, data engineers, back-end developers, and front-end developers. We also occasionally, when we are doing a feature that is related to a specific technical area in some part of the company, we'll bring people in from that other part of the company to work with us for a while. So right now we're eight people, plus an additional two people who are 50% working with the digital cell and 50% working in their home technical departments. Uh, this is our main product. It's called Engine Network. You're not likely to see it because it's not open to you. It's an internal product and it gives everybody in the company information about our engines, um, specifically about the engines that are out there mounted on airplanes and that are flying around right now. Lots of information about the current state of the engine, um, about the past, for instance, repairs that have been done on it. And also there are measurements inside it of pressures and temperatures, um, which we can visualize and do analytics on. And we also make predictions about the future of these engines. So how much are our customers going to fly them? When do we think that they're going to come in for maintenance? Um, what kinds of things might happen on them that might inconvenience you as a passenger? These are all things that we do um, in, in our team. So... I am a person who myself was a subject matter expert and then 
I was a solo developer, and then I became a full-time programmer, and now I'm the technical lead of the team. So I have a PhD in aerospace engineering. My background is in numerical optimization and robust design, so related to programming, but mostly mathematical stuff. Uh, when I first joined Rolls-Royce, I was in design engineering, and I was working on the design of the nacelle, which is the, the outer shell of the engine. Um, and then I moved over to doing numerical risk assessment, which is about predicting events on engines in the future. Then I joined the digital cell as a data scientist. I'm now the technical lead of the digital cell. Since I've become the technical lead and taken on the technical lead tasks, the digital cell has doubled in size. Um, and COVID was not easy on the aviation industry. Uh, and so a lot of the other parts of the company were shrinking while my team was growing. And so for that reason, we were bringing in people from other parts of the company. So they might be experts in, you know, structural mechanics or experts in something else, maybe done some programming as part of their job, um, but weren't necessarily your typical junior developer that, that you would bring into the team. Now, you might not be in the same kind of position in your company, especially if it's more of a typical tech company, um, and you might not need to hire internally, but I think being able to integrate these kinds of people with non-traditional software development backgrounds into a team can be useful for anybody because it really widens the pool of who you can hire into your team. So, you know, you don't necessarily need to bring somebody through the typical junior developer path. You can bring somebody who's worked as a long time as a solo developer or as some kind of a subject matter expert somewhere else into your team. So I'm just gonna talk for a couple minutes about some example team members, uh, people that we've brought into the team since I joined. These are real people. However, I've anonymized them um, so that I can share in this forum without calling individuals out. So the first person I have nicknamed the hair. So this is somebody who was working in a specific technical department, and he was really the only developer in that department, but he had his own product that he was working on, um, and he was sitting right next to his stakeholders. And the way that he normally worked was he'd ask the person sitting next to him, you know, what do you need from my product? He would get that change or that bug report, that feature request, and immediately uh, code it up and immediately run it on the computer that was sitting right in front of him and, and show it to them. Um, so he was used to this very fast agile development cycle. It really was agile because he would get features out within a day or two of somebody, of somebody requesting them. I wanted to bring him into the team. Um, I looked at his code. I thought it was really good code. So, um, and I also knew that he knew some tools and some libraries that nobody else in the team really did, um, that I didn't know, and that we wanted to move towards using. So I really wanted him in the team. And when he came, he brought that knowledge. Um, and that was really good. He also brought this really strong customer focus that he had developed by, you know, working side by side with his customers. Um, and he, he knew how to talk to them and convert what they were requesting into code. The challenge with the hair was that he was extremely frustrated with anything that slowed down his development at all. And the, the kinds of things that slowed that down were talking to the product owner and actually agreeing if a feature needed to be in there. Um, talking with me and with other members of the team about the architecture, conforming to the coding standards of the team. The whole pull request process 
uh, he was not used to it, and it essentially doubles the amount of time that it was taking to put out a feature. And that was really very frustrating for him. Uh, writing documentation and really any kind of communication with the team was something that he was finding really challenging to do and that he needed a lot of coaching and mentoring on. The second person that I want to talk about, and actually Sorrel already mentioned this person um, in, an, in an earlier talk, which was great, and it's actually in a very similar kind of metaphor. So this was a person who, uh, like me, had a PhD in a specific um, area of, of technical interest to the company. But when she joined the company, she actually joined it in a completely different department and became uh, very much an expert in another technical field inside aircraft engine engineering. Um, and while working in that, she developed an interest in data science and she taught herself data science. And then we brought her into the team after you know a few years of this, of this self-taught work. Um, she was great in that she was a very self-directed person, very much motivated to learn new things, had many interests. Unfortunately, those interests hadn't yet extended to like software development best practices. So she wasn't writing unit tests. She wasn't really following any kind of programming standards. Um, and she really needed a lot of help and coaching and mentoring on, on those topics. The other big challenge with the butterfly is that she wasn't always focused on what the rest of the team was focused on. So she had her own vision of where the company should be going in the future. She had a vision of where our product should be going in the future. And she would go off and she would, you know, she'd write proofs of concept of all sorts of cool ideas of things that we should be doing in the, in the product. But we just had to keep redirecting her um, back into the features that the product owner had decided was something that we needed to do. And the third person um, I want to talk about, we've nicknamed the owl. So this is a person who had very long experience in a technical role in the company. Um, they were very much the a subject matter expert in, in that particular area. And as we moved into that area, we wanted to add some features that were related specifically to that technical area in which they were the expert. Um, so we brought them into our team. We actually mostly brought them on as a stakeholder representative and also just to tell us how to do the actual math of what we needed to do in, in, the, in their technical area. But they also wanted to learn how to code and they wanted to, they, they had a strong interest in learning how to be part of a software development team. So we started doing that as well. Um, they had written code before, scripts to accelerate their, their day job tasks, but they really were missing the whole software engineering context. So they ha actually weren't using version control at all in their scripts. Um, they had never written a unit test in their life. Um, they didn't, they'd never heard of static analysis. They weren't even internally following any kind of consistent coding standards. Um, but the positive thing about this person was that they knew that they didn't know all these things. Um, and they were very much eager to learn and they were really, you know, ready uh, to, to have us teach them how to become uh, a really performant developer as part of a team. So now that we've talked about who some of these people were and what some of the challenges were with them, I want to talk about specifically what we did in order to train and coach and mentor these people to become part of the team. So the first thing is we needed to identify what the skills were that we were missing and we needed to provide clear documentation and coaching on those specific missing skills. 
Um, and here on the slide, I've listed some of the skills that we most commonly saw that were missing. Now, with the exception of one person who wasn't using version control, everybody else actually had used it inside their own projects. But if you ask somebody, hey, do you know Git? They'll say, yeah, I was working on it on my own project in the last couple of years. But that's actually working on version control as a solo developer is a completely different beast from doing it as part of the team. So you need to teach them about branching strategies. Um, there's a lot more potential for merge conflicts when you're part of a team. There's a lot more potential for completely somehow messing everything up so that it interferes with the workflow of everybody else in the team. Um, and so these were things that they needed specific mentoring and coaching on. Another thing about many of these people were they were, you know, sitting down at their development machine and they were developing it and then they were just running it locally on that same machine. Or maybe they had a web service, but they were deploying it from the machine that was sitting on their desk. Um, and so there was this whole idea of actually doing releases, of doing deployments, of developing for a target machine that isn't the same as their development machine that they needed to learn. Um, just knowing that they need that environment. The other thing was just teaching them that sense of responsibility that just because it works on their development machine doesn't mean it's done. <laughs> okay. They were just, oh yeah, it's done. Well, push it to prod, it doesn't work. Oh, but it works on my machine, end of story. Um, no, you actually have to pay attention to your code as it runs in prod and figure out what's wrong with it. I'm communicating with the product owner, as I, as I mentioned um, with the hair, you know, actually having multiple stakeholders. Um, many people were really only working with one stakeholder and they would just put in exactly what that person requested, but having to uh, go through the product owner because the product owner is managing many stakeholders and, and prioritizing them. Um, the product owner has a long-term vision for the product that this individual developer might not know um, and communicating with them about that before actually sitting down and, and coding it up. Um, communicating with project managers, saying when they've actually started working on something, giving estimates, telling people when they get stuck and when things are taking longer than they expect. People needed specific coaching on this kind of communication. Many of the people were following coding standards themselves, internally consistent ones, sometimes good ones, but they weren't used to having to compromise and agree those with a team. So, you know, they wanted to come in and just keep using the same coding standards they were using before and not, you know, have to um, agree it with everybody else. One thing that's really ha helped us in that is auto formatters. So if you work in, in Python, um, an example is black, uh, where it just, black has one answer for what the correctly formatted code is. And so then you don't end up with arguments in, in pull request reviews about comma placement. Okay, there's one answer, that's it. Actually, nobody really likes how black formats the code, but, uh, everybody dislikes it in different ways, and so they understand that we've actually had to compromise, um, and, and nobody is 100% happy with what, what they come up with. Um, communicating about code, talking to people before they write it, uh, writing doc strings, uh, giving good function names, good variable names, understanding that just because you write code that you're saying is simple and clear and anybody could understand it doesn't actually mean that somebody else will understand it um, and that you actually need somebody else to look at your code to determine that. Reading code written by other people. So many of these people were used to just sitting down with a blank piece of paper and starting to code and they had to learn the whole process of coming into an existing code base and actually reading what's there. Um, a big challenge there is if somebody needed 
something in their feature which was similar to something somewhere else in the code, they would tend to rewrite it themselves from scratch. Uh, we all know that as developers, reading your own code and writing code is actually much, much easier than reading code written by somebody else. And people tend to do that instead of actually figuring out um, how things are currently implemented, maybe refactoring it a little so that you can reuse the pieces of it uh, that are actually applicable to what you're doing. And finally, the code review process was new to some of these people. So uh, one person we brought into the team uh, wrote a feature and I reviewed the pull request because I always review the first two or three pull requests for, of everybody who came into the team. And, and I wrote, you know, this is a great function. It does what it's supposed to do. It's pretty long. Could you break it up into three pieces? And the answer was no. Or an answer like, uh, this works fine, or I like it better this way. Um, and really things that came across as not very tactful, um, not very diplomatic. And really people needed a lot of coaching in how to set aside their ego, how to understand that the purpose of code review is to improve the code, um, that it isn't about a personal attack on them, um, understanding that the, a person looking from the outside actually has an important and valuable perspective that isn't the same perspective as the author, um, that the author isn't the only one with expertise there. And just, you know, figuring out when to just do what the pull request reviewer has requested and when to stand your ground and push and how to do that in a diplomatic and tactful way that makes the reviewer feel like they're valued um, and doesn't destroy your relationship with the reviewer. One thing that became very clear in this whole process is that teamwork skills and communication skills are very important skills that are just as valuable as the technical skills that people bring. Uh, these skills, you can evaluate them in your hiring process. Probably the best way to do that is in the interview. They are trainable, there are courses, there are workshops, there are blog posts, there are all sorts of resources that you can give people if they need to improve their teamwork and communication skills. You need to tell people when they're falling short and you need to tell people, this is the level of teamwork and communication that I expect from you and this is where you need to get to. And as they work and as they improve on that, you need to tell them, if that work that they're doing is bringing them in the right direction, you need to give them positive feedback as they improve, or you need to redirect them to really working in the ways that are gonna make them as useful as possible as part of the team. Many of these people are extremely intelligent, extremely educated people. And so there's a little bit of a tendency to say, okay, yes, you're coming in with all these fantastic skills. You're a genius. So yeah, she's a genius. Just let her sit in the corner and pound out code. Nobody talk to her, leave her alone, let her do her genius thing. Uh, but that doesn't work. And that will destroy your team and your code in the long run. Because if they're not really engaging in your process, if they're not communicating with the team, it means that there's gonna be miscommunication, there's going to be interpersonal conflict, there's going to be inconsistencies in the code base, um, there's gonna be bugs that result from some of that. And uh, if that person ever leaves, there's nobody who understands their code. And that's not a situation that you ever want to find yourself in. One tactic that we've used is 
uh, pair programming. So we don't always do pair programming, but it's useful in certain situations, um, including soon after people join the team. We often pair program the first couple of features to get them into the code base. Um, but you can be smart about who you ask to pair program together. So I already talked about the hare, somebody who liked to code in a really speedy manner without a lot of planning or documentation. I have somebody else in the team who I could nickname the tortoise, um, in that he is very focused on the big picture. And he's very focused on planning and documenting and, you know, having everything completely planned out before he writes a, a line of code. The challenge with that person is that even a year into the, into him being in the team, I had actually seen very few lines of code from him. Um, so, we asked these people, the hare and the tortoise, to work together. Now, this can definitely be a challenge. Um, there's definitely a lot of potential for interpersonal conflict when you put two people with very different styles working together. So you have to be prepared to mediate when it becomes difficult, and you have to be prepared to insist that no, really, you have to do this together. Um, and you have to figure out your differences and your different work styles. And it benefits the code in that you get both people's strengths being reflected in the code. And it also benefits the developers because they pick up on each other's work styles. Hopefully in the long run, they start to value some of the things in the work style of the other person. Um, and you see them moving a little bit towards um, a more balanced developer uh, with, with different skill gaps. Things that I wish I had done better. So definitely we didn't do everything perfectly here. Um, and there are things that I've learned from this and that maybe mistakes that, that you won't do since I did them for you. Um, I think putting a lot of emphasis on teamwork and communication in the hiring process. So there was one person who we hired and I really pushed to hire him. Um, you know, it was me and the product owner and somebody else on the, on the hiring team. And I really wanted to hire this person. I thought his code was great. I thought he had a lot of knowledge that we didn't have, but our interview process actually did a pretty good job of showing that he, his communication skills were just not at where we would have hoped them to be. In retrospect, I kind of wish that I hadn't pushed so hard and that we had maybe hired a different candidate with more of a balance between the technical skills and the communication and teamwork skills. Another mistake that we made was a lot of these gaps we found when they caused a problem, when they caused a bug, when they caused an interpersonal conflict, when they somehow messed up the Git repo and nobody could actually commit anything. Um, and I, I, I wish I would have identified some of these missing skills earlier and done so more pro proactively. So about three slides back, I've got some of these commonly missed skills. And what I'd like to do in the future is to use that early. So ask people. So you've used Git for the last three years, but have you ever used it as part of a team? Um, and actually try as, as much as you can to identify the skill gaps early before they present problems for the team. The third mistake I think I made, so the butterfly came into our team. I gave her a lot of coaching and mentoring and help with some of her skill gaps. Um, and then the hair came and I was like, cool, awesome. I know how to do this. I know how to coach and mentor somebody. And I tried to use the same techniques and they didn't work nearly as well uh, because I, this was a completely different person, had different skill gaps, different strengths, came from a different background. Um, and I found that I really need to adapt um, exactly what kind of coaching and mentoring they need more specifically to the person. So if you 
only remember three things from the talk that I've said today. I'd like it to be these three. The first thing, subject matter experts and experienced solo developers are different creatures from junior developers. Um, that you don't really need to teach them how to code. That's not what they need. They need different treatment. The second thing to remember is that teamwork and communication are skill sets, skill sets that can be explicitly worked on and developed and that you should treat them as such um, and give people clear feedback on that. And the third takeaway I'd like you to remember is that you really need to pay close attention to that individual person in front of you. Make sure that the coaching, the mentoring, the training is adapted to that individual's needs um, rather than trying to use some kind of a cookie cutter approach. Thank you very much. And I'll be in the office hours um, if you want to talk to me.